Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. Our church's vision is to have a passion for God and compassion for people. We hope that the teachings in this podcast will encourage you as you seek to follow Christ and grow in your faith. Now, let's get into today's message. Well, good morning, Ritman Grace Brother and Church. How are we today? It's good to be here with you. My name is Clark. I'm the pastor here. And if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'd love to meet you and I'd love to meet your family after service. So feel free to stick around in the lobby, uh, maybe chat a little bit while your car's heating up. I don't know. Well, it's good to be here. We are going to be continuing in a sermon series. We actually began last week, and that is called Guilt, Fear, Shame, and Anger. So as you can imagine, we're talking about those things. And we are looking at how the gospel of Jesus frees us, not only from Satan and sin and death, but also other things which we might not often think about. But Jesus Christ and his gospel frees us from guilt and fear and shame and anger. And so if there's one thing that I know from the last 12 years of being a follower of Christ, it's that when God is on the move, extending his kingdom, when God is wanting to do the work of setting people free from the bondage of sin, our enemy becomes defiant. You know, the Bible talks about this in Ephesians 6. The apostle Paul writes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So one of the greatest things the gospel of Jesus brings to our lives is freedom. Not just freedom from sin and death, but freedom from fear, freedom from guilt, freedom from fear, uh, anger and shame. And as this series that we're in right now is going to progress over the ensuing weeks to come, I believe our enemy would like nothing more than to discourage our hearts and distract our minds. So last week when we kicked things off, we talked about facing our fears, facing our fears. And we said this, that fear is incredibly normal. Because the reality is, if you do not fear, if you did not fear, then you wouldn't be a human. Fear is something that awakens in childhood, and it's something that we carry with us through adolescence and even to adults. And so even though we have complex ways of hiding our fears, justifying our fears, and avoiding our fears, the reality is that deep down, we're still kids inside. And we realize that the world is a scary and dangerous place. And so we just need to acknowledge that that reality, the reality that our fears, facing our fears, rather than hiding from them. And so the question that we want to ask this morning is, how do we change? How do we change? How does the grace of God, how does the person and the work of Jesus Christ How does the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit help us to deal with our fear? How do we move from being a a fearful people to being a fearless people? How do we move from being a people who are enslaved to anxiety, enslaved to worry, to being a people who are set free and to new courage and new confidence? How do we become a people in our search for safety and security that find a sense of inner peace. What does that look like? And I think it's a two-step process. We need to do two things. We need to first repent, and we need to receive. We need to repent, and we need to receive. So I want to unpack that a little bit this morning. So step one is we need to repent. So let's, let's just acknowledge the reality that when some of you hear that word repentance, you're quick to think, oh, what an archaic term. What a religious term. That's from the old days. That has no pertinence on our life today. That's our knee-jerk reaction sometimes. Or what comes to mind is perhaps the college campus where you have the uninvited open-air preacher who is preaching fire and brimstone and calling the college students who are passing by to repentance. So many of us, when we hear that word repent, we carry along with it a number of negative connotations. But we need to understand that the Bible has a radically different position on repentance. The Bible says repentance leads to relationship with God. And much of the work we did last week, if you were here, 
What we did last week was kind of priming the pump, so to say, for repentance. If you weren't here last week, then I encourage you to go to rhythmandgrace.org and you can catch up on that, subscribe to our podcast. But what we did last week is we took a look at Genesis chapter 3. And what the Bible says there, we looked at Adam and Eve in the garden. And then we noticed immediately after sin entered into the world, fear came flooding in right behind it. And even though Adam and Eve existed in a place of security, they existed in a place of safety in the garden with God, they no longer felt safe. And they no longer felt secure. And their response to fear, just like you and me, by the way, was to run and to hide. And so we saw that last week. Fear entered into creation. They turned and they ran and they tried to find hiding. Yet, the gospel of Jesus Christ welcomes, invites a different response. It invites us to repent. It invites us to turn from our running and our hiding and to face our fears. And ultimately, to face our Father. That's the whole premise of repentance. It's, about, it's this about-face turn, this 180-degree turn that we're making. Rather than running from God out of fear, we turn and we begin to run to Him. And so as we're running to Him, we have to face the very fears that we're running from. And so repentance begins by facing our fears And we talked about that last week. When you're afraid, the best thing that you can do is to step out of hiding and to look at your fears, to look at your anxieties straight in the eye and identify them and name them and expose them to the light of day. And perhaps for some of us here or online, you have no idea what you're afraid of. Maybe you sense that you're running, but you have no idea what you're actually afraid of. So let me kind of recap a little bit of last week, gave you a few diagnostic questions to help you consider what that might be. Number one is, what keeps you awake at night? What do you find yourself trying to control? What increases your stress? What fears are present in your dreams? These are all just questions that can, we can use to identify what it is that we're afraid of. And then once we've identified our fears, once we've looked at our fears, we could begin to listen to our fears. Why do we do that? We need to listen to our fears. We said we need to do that because our fears are saying something. They're speaking. And oftentimes our fears say things like this. Life is dangerous. You are vulnerable. And then even more significant, that your trust is in something other than God. And so perhaps you fear being hurt, or you fear experiencing pain. That fear tells you to trust in your comfort for your security. If you fear being rejected, or you fear being alone, that fear will tell you to trust in approval or to trust in relationships. If you fear being overwhelmed, not having enough, if you fear that you're going to lose something very precious to you, that fear will tell you to trust and control. If you fear being seen as weak or being humiliated, then that fear will tell you to trust in power. The bottom line is that your fears tell you to trust something other than God. So what does your fears tell you to trust in for your security? Because it's at this point that we are on the verge of true repentance. But we're not quite there yet because we need to go one step further. By facing our fear, we do gain a tremendous insight. We become more self-aware, and this is good. It's healthy, and it's an important step, but it's nothing compared to the freedom that comes when we face our Father. And so when we face our Father, we don't just get knowledge. When we face your Father, you don't just get insight. When you face your Father, you get a relationship. A relationship that welcomes honesty. A relationship that welcomes vulnerability. And a relationship that welcomes your weaknesses. It's a relationship that even welcomes your confession. 
to come and to be honest before the Lord of how you struggle with unbelief, how you struggle with a lack of trust. So what does that confession look like before God with all of your fears and our misplaced trust? Maybe it looks like saying, God, I'm afraid of fill in the blank. I'm afraid of not having enough. I'm afraid of losing everything. I'm afraid of losing something very important to me. Maybe it looks like saying, I confess that I've put my trust in fill in the blank. Whatever that is for you. Approval, relationships, control, power. Perhaps it's praying to God, I've sought trust in those things instead of in you for security. I've served those things instead of you. I've allowed those things to dominate my life, to dominate my heart. God, forgive me, for I've sinned. That's just an example of what it might look like to come before your Heavenly Father in confession. And once we've done the work in step one, we can then turn to step two. Step one is to repent, and step two is to receive. To receive. And that's what takes us to what we're going to be looking at this morning in Psalm 23. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you now to turn with me to Psalm 23. If you don't have a Bible, you can use the ones in the chairs you're sitting in, but we'll also have the words up on the screen for you. The author of this psalm is King David. We read about him in our scripture reading this morning. Pretty famous story of David and Goliath. So if you're familiar with his life, you would know that he would know a thing or two. Just maybe he would know a thing or two about fear and distress and anxiety and worry. And sometimes we forget there's a distance in time and language and culture between the Bible and today. But we have to remember we're still reading about human beings with human experiences, with human emotions, which we all have. David knew a thing or two about fear. He knew a thing or two about distress, anxiety, and worry. And the Bible says that David grew up as a young man who was a shepherd himself. He had to protect the flock, and at times he came face to face with a bear or a lion. And he had to fight them off or even kill them. He was in battle, forced to face Goliath. Even after he was anointed king of Israel, he was frequently literally on the run for his life. And so David knew a thing or two about fear, anxiety, worry. But he knew, and you know, the transforming invitation when you're in the midst of your fear is to receive security and safety from God. And see, David was fully aware that he was living in a dangerous world. He was fully aware that he was vulnerable. But he didn't have to actively pursue God to be his shepherd because he was able to passively receive the fact that God was his shepherd. So the way I want to structure the rest of our time together is by looking at how David received three things. He received God's presence. We're going to see that David received God's protection. And then finally, David received God's provision. Presence, provision, protection. At that same time, this is true for you. And some of you, you really need to hear this this morning. Psalm 23 provides for you the truth that you can trust God in the face of your fears. You can trust God in the face of your fear because he is generous with his presence, he's generous with his protection, and he is generous with his provision. Listen to the intimacy of this language of presence. The Bible says in Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. In other words, you are not alone in your fear. There's an intimacy to shepherding. Shepherds know their sheep because they're with them every day, all day. 
They learn their actions. They learn their habits. They learn their preferences. See, without a shepherd, sheep are lost. Sheep are in danger. Sheep are unable to endure the realities of this world. Without a shepherd, sheep are afraid. But to think of God as a shepherd is to come to understand the intensely personal, comforting, attentive nature of God's care for his people. Specifically, God's care for you. The sheer number of times that God speaks to your fears in the Bible do not fear, do not be afraid, do not be anxious. Over 300 times in the Bible, he cares about your fears much more than you know, much more than you realize. And he's not so busy that he only attends to major fears or major crises of your life. No, he's intimately aware of all of your fears. Even the small ones, even the ones that seem insignificant. He's close and he speaks to your fears, to your anxieties, to your worries. Fear desperately wants you to feel alone, to feel isolated, to feel vulnerable. And so what we need to do is to receive God's presence because he's with you. He is your shepherd. But not only that, receive God's protection. Notice what David says next in verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. I think one of the reasons why the image of God as a shepherd, being a protector, breaks down for us is because the simple reality that we forget that we're sheep. We forget that we're sheep. We tend to think that we're standing eye to eye with the shepherd. But that's just simply not the case. If you picture God as a shepherd and you're standing next to the shepherd as a pastor, a CEO, a businessman, a principal, a teacher, a student, as a mother, here's what happens. The protection of the shepherd is not that powerful. It doesn't leave you with a sense of awe. But if you realize that God is a shepherd, that he is the king of the universe, the creator, the sustainer of all things. And you're a sheep. You start to understand the weight and the significance of the protection of the shepherd. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Because you're with me, because you're bigger than me, you're stronger than me, you're able to protect me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd's rod and staff, the rod was an instrument of protection. It was the long straight end, it was a weapon. And if there was danger coming from the outside, the shepherd was able to take the rod and fight off danger. Think of it as a stick, using it to hit things away and protecting. But the shepherd also had a hook, the staff. Also an instrument of protection for when the sheep themselves put themselves in a place of danger. When the sheep themselves put themselves near a cliff or into water, the shepherd's able to use the hook and to pull them out and bring them back to safety. You see, for David, the fact that The shepherd was carrying that instrument, carrying that tool to protect him from the dangers of the world, but also to protect them from their own foolishness, their own ignorance. That brought a lot of comfort and a lot of peace. For some of you, you fear the dangerous aspects of the world. You fear being hurt or you fear experiencing pain. You fear something happening to you or to those that you love. Others of you fear wandering and doing something foolish. Hear me. The Lord is your shepherd. Receive his protection of you because he's with you and he is looking out for you with a tremendous strength. We can receive God's presence. We can receive God's protection. But then lastly, we can receive God's provision. Notice what David says in verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me 
in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the language of generous provision. Notice what David says, preparing a table for you, anointing you with oil, giving you a place in his house for eternity. You see, fear and anxiety are often an undercurrent in our life because we don't believe that God is generous. We don't believe that God is going to provide. But our God is abundantly generous. Our God gives forgiveness. He gives reconciliation. He gives love, power, meaning, significance, identity, peace. All the things that come with the kingdom of God, he gives them generously. The generosity of God is probably most profoundly displayed in the person of Jesus Christ, who identified himself in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, as the good shepherd. And look what Jesus says in the New Testament of John's Gospel. Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life have it to the full. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep, runs away, and then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Notice what Jesus says next, verse 14, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In the midst of your fears, Jesus stands with you. He does not run, he does not hide, he stays. And he courageously gives all of himself when you, in the moment of your greatest vulnerability, when you're in the moment of your greatest danger, Jesus, the good shepherd, willingly became the sacrificial lamb on your behalf to provide, to provide you the full inheritance of the kingdom of God. There's abundant generosity in God. We need to receive God's provision God is a generous provider. He provides us the things that we need. He provides us His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He provides us His Holy Spirit for us to become a more courageous people, a more joyful people, a more peaceful people. We need to walk through these steps of both repentance and receiving. We need to repent. We need to face our fears. But we also need to face our Father. We need to receive. We need to receive God's presence. We need to receive God's protection. We need to receive God's provision. And that's going to be very challenging when we are in the midst of our fears and our anxieties because those things are manic. But we can begin to cultivate what it looks like to receive who God is and what He's done for us And what he wants to do for us, receiving his grace. When those things begin to happen, our fears aren't necessarily eliminated, right? Our fears don't just disappear. It doesn't work that way. Because what it means to be human is to have some sense of fear in you. But when we're resting in God's provision for us, resting in what God gives us, those fears are no longer ultimate. They stop bossing you around. They no longer have you in that manic state. And when that happens, you find within yourself this capacity to become more courageous, to live more courageously. You find then courage to slow down and face your fears. 
You find the courage to face the world. You find the courage to be honest about your misplaced trust and the courage to confess that before the Lord and to come before Him with openness and vulnerability and honesty. And you find the courage to worship Him in the midst of our fears. One of the most courageous things that you can do in the midst of your fear and anxiety is to worship God. To praise the Lord Jesus. You find within yourself the courage to give of yourself, the courage to help others. We live in a fearful world. I don't have to give you studies. You could turn on the news. You could read the headlines. It doesn't take long to figure out that we live in a fearful world, that people are afraid. We live in a culture that is enslaved by fear. And God wants to set his people free. When you've been set free from your fear, when your fear is no longer bossing you around, and when, you, when your fear is no longer the ultimate thing in your life, you become a powerful instrument in the hands of God to go with a capacity to make courageous disciples in our communities, to raise up courageous disciples in your family. Courageous disciples who don't go running and hiding at every sign of fear, but rather to live fully present in the right here and now. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, your word tells us that there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. God, would you help us this morning to receive your love today? Would you help us to receive your love even in this very moment? Maybe some of us here would do that for the first time. Or someone watching online today would do that for the first time and just put a stake in the ground and come to know you through faith, through repentance. The love that manifests itself in your presence, in your protection, your provision, would you make that known to us today? Would you remind us of that love for those of us who already know you and love you and follow you? God, help us to delight and to rejoice in you, seeing you as bigger and more powerful than we have. God, we confess our misplaced trust to you this morning. All the ways that we perhaps have minimized you and made you, made a big deal out of our fears. God, would you, by your Holy Spirit, right that wrong in our soul today? Would you set us free to experience a tremendous joy and freedom from our fears? God, would you help us to make courageous disciples, to be instruments of your grace? God, we pray all these things for our good, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our church's mission is to follow God, share his truth, and be examples of the love of Jesus to all. If you would like to know more about us, you can visit our website at www.rittmangrace.org or drop by anytime for one of our in-person Sunday morning worship services. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Rittman Grace Podcast.